session. So um, if we could all hang on and paying attention as the uh, talks keep going on. Um, our next speaker is Renee Vidal, who's going to be speaking about sparse and low rank subspace clustering. Thanks. Hello. Can you all hear me very well? Yes? In the back? <clears throat> so after so many talks, and, and thank you for being here at, after lunch, and I know you're starting to fall asleep. But after so many talks, I think uh, pretty much everybody knows at this point what does it mean to do rank minimization. And we have seen that in that case, the way of modeling the data is by saying that there is one low dimensional subspace that models the data. And we have seen how by minimizing nuclear norms, you can do matrix completion or robust PCA. We've all seen many, many times now the idea of uh, sparse models. And uh, I would like to say that the key difference is now is that instead of one low dimensional subspace, in, with k sparse signals, I have many subspaces. In fact, I have a combinatorial number of them. Uh, and the, another key feature of them is that the dimensions are equal, and the dimension of the subspaces is equal to the sparsity level. So uh, following Guillermo, uh, what I'm going to push for is that if we are mo going to model data, having that many subspaces is way too many. In the same way that we want to model data with low dimensional structures, we want to model them with a few subspaces and not a combinatorial number of them. And so uh, the type of model is going to be therefore slightly different. We're going to have a dictionary uh, of data. The dictionary is going to be divided into multiple groups, D sub 1 through D sub n. Um, each group is now going to be of low rank. Uh, so D1 is a low rank matrix, Dn is a low rank matrix. But I'm allowing the dimensions to be different, unlike this sparse model where the dimensions need to be equal and equal to the sparsity level. And therefore, the way I'm going to generate signals, the same way that, uh, that uh, Guillermo said yesterday, is uh, I'm going to pick one block and then take a linear combination from that block. And now there are two cases. Do I know the blocks? And typically, this shows up in classification problems, where every block corresponds, perhaps, to the training set for one class. And therefore, I know what the blocks are, and I can put them in this particular order. But I have a matrix P over there, which is a permutation, which is meant to be that there are several cases where I don't know the ordering of the data. I don't know that the first column comes from the first group, or the second column comes also from the first group. So this P is unknown in clustering. And what I want to actually do, part of the clustering problem, is to find out what that permutation matrix is. So more specifically, this is the mathematical statement of the problem. Given a cloud of data points that come from a collection of low dimensional subspaces, uh, find what the number of subspaces is, find what their dimensions are, and they are allowed to be different find the basis for every subspace, and find the segmentation of the data, because I don't know which point comes from which subspace. All right. Now, this problem is a chicken and egg problem. If I knew which point comes from which subspace, I could just do standard analysis. If I knew uh, a basis for every subspace, I could easily uh, assign a point to each one of the subspaces. But the challenge is that I don't know which point comes from which subspace, and I need to estimate both a model per group, as well as the segmentation of the data simultaneously. In addition, data can be contaminated by noise, by outliers, and also corrupted by missing entries. So I need to be able to discover this multi-subspace structure under all such cases. And this problem shows up in lots of applications in video processing, segmenting videos, uh, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to talk about some, some of them. So there's been a lot of work over the last decade or so on this problem. And by and large, the vast majority of all the first works were iterative. And this was along the lines of what Guillermo presented two days ago. So you give me the segmentation, I find the basis for the subspaces. You give me the basis, I segment the data, and then I iterate. Uh, and this can be done using extensions of k-means or in a probabilistic framework using mixtures of PCAs. And uh, the big issue with this, as pointed out by one of the questions, uh, to Guillermo was, well, how do I choose the number of subspaces? He said, I'm going to choose 20, and that was good. Uh, how do I choose the dimensions? And uh, well, the dimensions are generally unknown. And so, and third, initialization. This is a very non-convex problem. And therefore, depending on how you initialize, either with the segmentation or with the basis, you can easily converge to one of the many local minima. 
So uh, some of these issues were recently addressed by the paper of Chen uh, and Larry, uh, where they put Dirichlet and beta processes to actually model the fact that the number of subspaces is unknown and the dimensions are unknown. But the initialization continues to be a critical issue. Very surprisingly, there was work in the early 2000s saying that, in fact, the problem in the absence of noise can be solved exactly and in closed form using a technique called generalized PCA. And that technique works for all kinds of subspaces. It doesn't have any requirements. Uh, and uh, the key idea is that the union of subspaces is, can be modeled as the zero set of a polynomial. And the polynomial factorizes with one factor per group. Therefore, the purely algebraic method to do this is to feed a polynomial to the data and factorize it. And I can find solutions in closed form uh, to do that. But that's only if there is no noise. As soon as you have outliers and noisy data, the polynomials aren't very good, and the factorization of the polynomial is very sensitive. So by and large, the community has settled on techniques that are based on spectral clustering, uh, which is what I'm going to explain in a minute, and this is what this specific talk is about. And if you want to know a little bit more about several of these methods, uh, just uh, there is a tutorial can, that came this year. So how do you do with spectral clustering? If you, uh, the, what you do is the following. You say, well, I'm going to represent, I'm going to build a graph. Every data point is going to be a node in the graph, and this is meant to uh, simulate that. Then I'm going to connect two data points with an edge, and that's going to be a weighted edge denoted here by a weight Cij. And the idea is that to do this uh, well, I'd like the Cij to be big if the two points belong to the same group, and small if the two points belong to different groups. And this, ideally, if the data is sorted according to the groups, I'd like to get this block diagonal structure where black means high similarity and white means low similarity. And once I'm able to do that, and I can build this similarity, I can compute the Laplacian. And once I do that, if you look at the eigenvectors of the Laplacian and plot them, now you get uh, clusters, each one of the clusters corresponding to each one of the different groups. Problem is, how can you come up with a similarity matrix for subspaces? So if you look at the data here, this point in one corner and that point in the other corner are very far from each other but they belong to the same group. So this idea of building a similarity based on distance is not possible. Conversely, if you have these two points that are very close and near the intersection, they are very close, but they're in different groups, so I don't want them to be close. So in the ideal world, what I like to do is to connect a point to other points that are in the same subspace. And if I'm able to do that exactly, I'll get a perfect block diagonal similarity matrix, and then I'll be able to get a perfect cluster. So how do I do that? And the key challenge, in fact, is that pairwise similarity is sort of not well defined for subspaces. If I give you two points, how do you know they belong to the same subspace? Any two points will belong to a line, for instance. So what we're going to do is to exploit what I call here a self-expressive model. And here is the basic idea. If you have data that comes from a union of subspaces, you can always take a data point and write it as a linear combination of all the other data points. Namely, you can think of the data as a dictionary, and you're expressing other points in the union of subspaces in terms of that dictionary. So in vector notation now, this means that the jth point is written as the dictionary times ci, which is a vector of coefficients, and this is just the dictionary of the data. And in matrix notation, I can simply write that the data is equal to itself times a matrix of coefficients. And all what that means is that data points can be expressed in terms of other data points. And so what this talk is going to be about is to exploit two types of constraints on C. Because obviously, this is, you could say this is very silly. Take C to be the identity, and that's a solution of D is equal to DC. But the identity is not a very good solution, because that means that I just connect every point to itself and not to anybody else. And therefore, I'm never going to get the clustering from it. So there are actually many possible solutions to D equals to DC. And I'm going to look for solutions that are sparse or solutions that are low rank. And the point of this talk is to tell you why that is a good idea and why that is going to allow me to solve the clustering problem. So this is the first uh, method. I'm going to describe two methods, the first one based on sparsity, the second one based on uh, low rank. So here, I'm going to say the data can be expressed in terms of itself. I'm going to allow for some errors that are either noise or outliers. 
Uh, the diagonal is zero because I don't connect the point to itself. And I'm just going to minimize the one norm, uh, and this is what is uh, enforcing sparsity. And here it's some norm. It could either be the two norm for noise or the one norm for outlier. And I'm going to show that uh, this, this model facts has the following properties. One, with perfect data, you can get a perfect similarity matrix, namely that in the sparse solution, the non-zero coefficients will correspond to the same subspace. The model can handle outliers and noise and missing data very well. Uh, and in fact, it's been uh, one of the best algorithms on a database of over 150 videos for motion segmentation. The second model is going to look for uh, low rank. And so here the data is going to be expressed in terms of a clean dictionary of data plus errors. And the errors can be noise of outliers. And now I'm going to enforce that self-similarity on the clean data only. So the clean data is linear combinations of itself. And I'm going to look for a low rank matrix of coefficients. And again, either some two, er two norm on the error or one norm of the error, depending on whether it's noise or outlier. So this problem is actually in principle or perhaps a little bit more difficult than that because uh, I have this multiplication here. A and C are unknown and therefore this is not convex necessarily. Nonetheless, I'm going to show that the problem can be solved in closed form. There is a closed form solution to this very difficult problem uh, for multiple subspaces uh, and some cases. And the some cases are with noise. If this is the two norm, uh, this can be solved in closed form even though it's non-convex. The uh, second thing is that the way in which you do the closed form solution is based on thresholding the singular values. But the thresholding is not the classical shrinkage thresholding. But essentially, you threshold the singular values by solving for the roots of a polynomial. And that's why I call this the polynomial thresholding operator. And I'm going to show how that's the case. So let me begin then with the first method. Remember, first method based on sparsity, second method based on uh, rank minimization. So the method based on sparsity is based on the following idea, that if you take a data point like the red point and you write it as a linear combination of all the other data points, then you can always write this red point as a scalar multiple of that black point. And so in this case, if you look for a sparse solution, the sparsity level is 1, and that's because the dimension of the subspace is 1. More generally, every data point always has a sparse representation with respect to the, uh, the data that comes from D points in the same subspace. And that representation is actually not unique. Many of the results on sparsity look for a unique sparse representation. Here it's not unique because the data is low rank and any D points in the same group are equally good from the perspective of clustering. Now, is it the case that this is always true, namely that if you write a point as a sparse combination of all the others, you always get the non-zero coefficients come from the same group? And that's not always true. So you can take this red point, which is very happy to write itself as a linear combination of those two yellow points in the same plane. And by that matter, as a linear combination of any two points uh, in the plane. But that red point can also be written as a linear combination of that yellow over there and that yellow over there, because it happens to lie in that line. So the level of sparsity in both cases is two, two from the plane or two from each one from each one of the different lines. Uh, but one is right, namely whenever you pick two points from the same subspace, or the other one is not right because it picks points from different subspaces. So the question is, when is it the case that if I expand the point as a sparse combination of other data points, the non-zero coefficients come from the correct subspace? When is it the case? Are there conditions under which I can guarantee that? Are they going to be of the restricted isometry property type of conditions or not? The second one is, uh, if it is the case that the sparsest uh, solution comes from the same uh, subspace, how can I compute it and how can I compute it efficiently? And particularly, can I still compute it using L1 minimization, for example? So the answer is that the kinds of conditions that you need uh, have nothing to do with incoherence necessarily, have nothing to do with the restricted isometry property. In fact, it is way simpler, even though the problem at first is much more difficult. Uh, sufficient conditions are, one of them has to do with the subspaces being independent. What the meaning of independent is that the dimension of the sum of the subspaces is equal to the sum of the dimensions. I'm illustrating this case, uh, the sum of uh, the dimensions is two for the two lines and the dimension of the ambient space is two. 
Uh, the second case is when the subspaces are disjoint, namely that they intersect only at the origin, and this is an example of these joint subspaces. Nonetheless, notice that these are not independent because the sum of the dimensions is three and the dimension of the ambient space is two. So these are independent, uh, but these are not independent. So what are the theorems? Theorem number one is that if the data is drawn from a union of independent subspaces, and that's all that's, that's needed uh, for the theorem to work, then the subspace sparse representation, and the meaning of that is that the non-zero coefficients come from the correct subspace. The subspace sparse representation can be found by solving this L1 problem, where you write a point as a linear combination of other points, and that's why the CII is set to be zero. And you just minimize the L1 norm. If instead of linear subspaces, you're dealing with affine subspaces, then all you need to do is to just enforce that the sum of the coefficients is one, which is just one more linear constraint. So again, it can be solved in the standard way. What about this joint? For this joint, you need a little bit more. And the little bit more that you need actually makes a lot of sense. There is always this issue that if you have data in different subspaces, you would expect that as the subspaces get closer to each other, then it should be much harder for the subspaces to be recovered. And that's exactly what this condition says. This says that the angle between subspace i and j, the maximum angle is to be less than some threshold. If the maximum angle is less than a threshold, that means that the angle needs to be bigger than something. Uh, this, sorry, this is the cosine of the angle here. Square root of this of i, it also depends on the dimension of the i subspace. And this quantity over here is the ith singular value of a data matrix that has only these sub-i points and come from the i subspace. So by and large, what the condition is really saying is that data needs to be well spread out inside the i subspace, and that the subspaces need to be sufficiently separated in subspace n. So uh, coming back now to the algorithms, as I said, uh, the non-convex problem was to find a sparse solution. You can round, now write everything in matrix form. Rather than solving for each individual point as a linear combination of the others, you can now set up a joint optimization problem over all the coefficients. So C is now the matrix of coefficients. D is equal to DC, and the diagonal needs to be 0. And all we have done is to relax the 0 semi-norm by the 1 norm. This is just the sum of the absolute values of all the entries of C. So how do we need now with noise? If the data is corrupted by noise, then what we minimize instead of just the one norm, we add a Frobenius norm on the errors, and everything else is the same. And this is just lasso. Uh, that's, that's all what we do. With data corrupted by outliers, uh, what we do here is to assume that the outliers are also sparse, namely not every entry of the data point is contaminated, but only a small fraction. And now what that means is that you still get a linear set of equations where the dictionary built by the data is just augmented by the identity matrix. And then you solve identically the same problem as before. So the last thing is how do you deal with data corrupted by missing entries? All we do here is a very simple technique, which is you just collect the indices of the data points that are uh, missing or the entries that are missing. And you just uh, take y tilde to be the data point except for the missing entries. You do the same thing for the dictionary. And then you s solve identically the same problems. You find the coefficients, and then you can fill in the missing entries. All right. So I've shown so far that if you enforce sparsity on the matrix of coefficients, you can solve the problem exactly. And you can handle outliers and missing entries uh, in the relatively standard ways. So what about the second case, low rank now? In the low rank case, um, the data now, what I'm going to exploit is the fact that every subspace on its own is of low dimension. So the rank of the i-th data matrix associated with the i subspace has dimension d sub i, which is much smaller than the dimension of the ambient space. So if I do that, you can take the, you know, I don't know the segmentation of the data. There is this p over here, but if you knew the data points in the ith group, you can compute the compact SVD, the rank D sub i SVD, and you would get this matrix D sub i that only has D sub i columns and is orthonormal. So you can now insert the IVI transpose here on the right, and because the i transpose V is the identity matrix, I have done nothing. So this is still true. But now this means that D sub i is equal to itself times something. 
And if you put that together into a matrix, this means that the beta is equal to itself times a block diagonal matrix here that has this VI, VI transpose on the block diagonal, and still times the permutation matrix. So this means that there exists, out of all the possible solutions of D is equal to this DC, there is one possible C that has this structure, meaning it's block diagonal, up to the permutation matrix that is unknown. Uh, and it's also low rank, because the rank is at most the sum of the individual dimensions of the subspace. So that motivates the idea that among all the possible solutions of D is equal to DC, not only the identity is a solution, there are some solutions that are sparse, there are some other solutions that are low rank, and therefore setting up an optimization problem, searching for the low rank makes sense. So uh, this is what we're going to do. Suppose that I minimize now the rank of C subject to D is equal to DC. And instead of minimizing the rank, I'm going to minimize the nuclear norm. As it turns out, this problem can be solved in closed form. And the closed form solution, actually both problems, the non-convex and the convex one, have the same solution. And the solution can be obtained from the SVD of the data. You simply take uh, U sigma V, and then you uh, take the, the first R columns of V, where R is the rank of the data matrix. And VR, VR transpose, is the optimal solution. And that's what the optimal C is. But of course, this requires noise-free data so that you can get the rank right, and so on and so forth. Moreover, we have proven that this C that is obtained as VR, VR transpose, has the property that we want, namely that the non-zero entries corresponds to CIJ is non-zero if points I and J are in the same group. So uh, what we do in this particular case uh, now, suppose that I have noise and outliers. What we're going to do is to now minimize the nuclear norm of C plus some norm on the errors, subject to a clean dictionary A being equals to AC, and subject to the data is equal to the clean dictionary plus the errors. Now, this problem is a little bit more involved with noise and outliers. The reason being that this is non-convex. I have this A equals to AC, and now I'm optimizing both over the clean dictionary as well as over the matrix of coefficients and the matrix of outliers or not. So uh, I'm going to go through a few special cases to show that very important uh, cases can be actually solved in closed form. And uh, let me go uh, very quickly since I'm running out of time. So suppose that I relax that self-expressive constraint. I minimize the rank of C subject to an error between A and AC. And suppose that A is given. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to apply this directly to the data. Then the optimal C can be computed in closed form. And notice that the only difference with respect to before is this tau, because I'm paying sort of a penalty here due to the fact that I relax the self-expressive net constraint. Nonetheless, the similarity matrix still is computable in closed form. Second, what about the more general case? I'm going to optimize both over the clean dictionary and over the matrix of coefficients. I'm going to relax the equality constraint on the self-expressiveness. And this is just saying that I want the clean dictionary to be close to the data. Very, very surprisingly, this problem also has a closed form solution. How do you compute it? You compute the SVD of the data. The A, the clean dictionary, can be computed from the same U and the same V as the data matrix, except that the, the, the singular values change. And these singular values, lambda, are different from the sigmas that are here. And the C matrix is on closed form as before. And the only question then is how are the singular values of the data related to the singular values of the clean data? And the relationship is via this uh, nonlinear equation. In this case, it's linear. In this case, it's nonlinear. So in principle, you have a fourth order degree polynomial to solve in order to do the thresholding of the singular values of the data. This is, uh, therefore, the solution. Rather than having the standard hard thresholding or the shrinkage thresholding, I have this polynomial thing. And this polynomial is as follows. In fact, for some range of the parameters, this, we have proven that the solution, uh, this is increasing, and therefore, there is always a unique solution. For some other range of the parameters, you have this the non-convexity shows up here. And you have up to three possible solutions. Nonetheless, we have proven that out of these three, only one gives you the global minimum. And therefore, there is just one solution. I'm going to skip quickly the case of outliers. But by and large, if you're familiar with the robust PCA, you can do robust GPCA, or robust multiple subspaces, 
by using the standard iterative uh, thresholding algorithm, except that you replace the uh, standard shrinkage thresholding by this polynomial threshold. Um, since I don't have too much time, let me uh, skip a few of, of the results. And I'm going to just show you. In this case, what we're doing is taking videos of news. And what we want to do is to separate them into groups of frames where the frames have roughly the same semantic meaning. So in this case, Obama is giving a speech. Some videos are mostly from the front. Some videos are mostly from the left. And you can see how you can get a very good segmentation of the data in time. In the other video, it was one of the debates between uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton at the time of the election. And you can see that as different shots of the video are being displayed, and even there are zoom in and zoom out and so on and so forth, you can get each one of the groups uh, of the data very well. This is another example looking at videos that have uh, very complex dynamics and even uh, rigid objects. And in this case, you can see how you get three different groups corresponding to just the water, then the water with the boat, or vice versa. The last video um, uh, is showing lots of different scenes, including videos with water, moving cars, and each one of the groups is, in this case, perfectly segmented. So bottom line, I didn't have the time, but there are lots of problems in computer vision that can be expressed as clustering subspaces. And I've shown two methods based on sparsity and random minimization that allow you to solve these very complex problems involving unions of subspaces. And also, I've shown you guarantees, namely conditions under which uh, the algorithms uh, work, and the notion of independent subspaces and disjoint was critical to do that. We're currently working on extending these to nonlinear manifolds, and for the last algorithm also for uh, matrix completion in unions of subspaces. Thank you very much. So we, we have time for just a question or two while we get set up for the next speaker. Questions? Yes. The capital K. Ah. The dimensions of the subspaces are never enforced by the method, because you write a point as a linear combination of the others. And the sparsity level, uh, which is not specified, uh, gives you what the dimension of the subspace is. As per the number of subspaces, uh, pardon? Back up, that's me. It does not matter too much. So what happens, think of lasso, for example, as uh, there is a parameter that you set in the lasso, right? As you vary the parameter, the level of sparsity changes. Uh, we have observed that while the neighbors that you pick might vary, the fact that those neighbors come from the same group does not change too much. Uh, therefore, the algorithm is very robust to having incorrect dimensions for the subspaces, uh, which is equivalent to saying correct settings of the parameters. Uh, we don't know a priori for videos what is the dimension of every subspace. But for the perspective of clustering, it doesn't matter too much what those dimensions are. Now, for, for, as per the number of groups, uh, that is pre-specified for spectral clustering. Uh, and in all the experiments we have done, we always pre-specify the number of groups. Nonetheless, uh, there are various techniques uh, for spectral clustering for automatically determining the number of groups based on the eigengaps of the Laplacian of the graph. Okay, we, we better move on. Let's, let's thank him again.